wanna be a sacrifice. I wanna be a lay down lover all my life. I wanna be the oil. I wanna be a sacrifice. I wanna be a lay down lover all my life.
I'll never comprehend the way you love us. It's unthinkable. Only heaven knows just how far you go to say you. We've had a really tough week. We're just, we just want to seek you tonight, Lord. We just want to hear from your word. We want to know what you have to say about this world, Lord, and about us. And we want to follow you in that, Lord. We want to hear your truth. We want to experience your truth as well, Lord. We love you so, so much, Lord. And that is why we're here singing your praises. We love you so much. Amen. Well, welcome, you guys. Um, if you guys want to just look to your left and your right, like there's people out there um, that uh, just say hello um, tonight, and then we'll get into announcements real quick. How you guys doing? Happy Tuesday. Um, hopefully it's a happy Tuesday. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, but we're glad you're here. Even if it was the worst Tuesday of your life, I think you're in the right spot. Um, welcome to Atmosphere Young Adults. Again, if this is your first time, we're really excited you're here. My name is Dylan. And uh, man, I'm just kind of distracted. I'm thinking about like I was just kind of in a moment with that last song. I was hoping we would just stay there for like 30 minutes. Um, I'm just going to start praying real quick. Uh, there's just this, um, when we can be encountered by the love of God, there's a change that happens in your life. And I think so many of us, I'm just jumping right in. I think so many of us know that intellectually. You could have been a Christian. You might've been going to church your entire life, but I want you to know that there's like a real love that you can encounter that'll change your life. Let me pray before we even get anything going here. Um, Lord, we are, we just want to stand in awe of you. Even if our heart is not in awe of you, Lord, would we put our mind there and let our heart follow? God, meet each and every one of us in this place tonight in the way that you do, in your unique way with your power. Maybe for the first time in a long time, would you meet us here in this place? So grateful for these gatherings, Lord. Would you just be so present here? In Jesus' name, amen. Um, all right, I have some announcements for us real quick, and then we're gonna get right into it. The first announcement, you saw it rolling before, we have our Dodger game in, is that next week? I think that's, that might be a week from this Friday. Uh, there are still a few spots left, so make sure uh, you get some tickets, scan the code there on the screen uh, to do that. You can also go to uh, our Instagram account, and then you could find it in the, uh, in the bio there, but we uh, would love to go to the game with you. Even if you don't like the Dodgers, it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll have a Dodger dog eating contest and the whole thing. It's going to be sweet. 
One other important announcement that I want to make really quick. Pastor Jim called uh, Tanner and I. He was blowing up our phones right as we were about to start, so like might be important. But uh, there is this event happening this Saturday, uh, a parents' night out event for parents in our church that have young kids. They're going to be going to Stonehouse. And then at the church here, the kids are going to be here for babysitting. And more kids signed up to be like babysat than we have available Anyway, if you want to make a hundred bucks, ladies specifically, if you want to make a hundred bucks on Saturday night to babysit some uh, awesome kids, we would really appreciate that. And I think a hundred bucks, you would appreciate that. So if you want to do that, uh, you could just, we have an atmosphere phone number, which you, if you've been here on a Sunday, you would know it. I wish I could just throw it up on, I don't have a slide. I don't think I could throw it up. I'll tell it to you right now. I, you know what, just come find me after. I don't want to say that. Just come find me after and be like, yeah, I'm down to do that babysitting thing, even if we've never met. We, you don't even, just whatever, and I'll give you the information. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, I'm sure some of you will be able to do that. Uh, I'm going to pray one more time. I just want to do that, and then we're going to go right in. Uh, as I do that, after I do that, you can find yourself at Luke chapter 9. So that's where we're going to start tonight, Luke chapter 9. Lord, we just want to... Um, focus all of our attention on you as we read, um, read the scriptures and stare at you and glorify you. God, I'm just thankful for everyone in this room tonight, where we all are, where we've all been. Use this moment tonight, uh, however you desire. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25, Jesus speaking. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Uh, I, some of you guys know I played football in high school. Uh, we were not very good. I don't want to ask, I want anyone asking what our record was, but I played football in high school and my, I was like, when I was like still a little kid, it was my freshman year going into my sophomore year. We had a strength and conditioning coach. He was the best guy ever, but he was gnarly, uh, just crazy dude. And we did this thing every summer. It was in August when we'd have two a days and it would get really hot. And it was every year that he was there, we did this thing. It was the conditioning test and a lot of schools have different variations of it. We did a, did a conditioning test. And so I'm, you know, 14, 15, however old you are at that point. Like, I, you know, I've never done that many hard, I haven't done that many hard things in my life. And uh, we're doing this conditioning test. And I vividly remember a moment. I mean, there's kids puking, passing out, like the whole thing is going on. But if you didn't pass the test, there was like some serious repercussions. And that's why I don't know the legality thing, but what would happen to you kind of down the road. So I was determined, like I was going to pass this test. And it was so, I was like, this is the worst thing I've ever done in my entire life. I remember thinking that. To this day, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. And just terrible. And like, if anyone wants to do it later on, I could, you know, I'm not going to do it again, but you could do it. I could tell you what it was. It was super gnarly. But then I remembered, uh, as I think back, I remember a certain point in that season, in a game, I think we were in overtime, again, it was my sophomore year, and it was late in the game. People were exhausted. People were tired. And I remember like, seeing myself and my team, and I was like, oh, like, we're actually not that tired. Like, we're, wait a minute, like, the suffering that we went through for that conditioning test has put us in a position where we're able to, like, play out an entire football game right now. And it was one of the first times in my life that I saw the benefit of a seat, like, a, a time of serious struggle and hardship, and it's simple, it's just a conditioning test in football. But I remember that vividly as, like, the fruit of a struggle being super evident. And I read a quote this week, and it says this, the devil sits at the summit of a comfortable life. The devil sits at the summit of a comfortable life. You're welcome for that one. Um, that is not an idea that most of us naturally are super excited about unless you're David Goggins, right? Where you're like, I love pain, suffering, and torture. I just want to do that all the time. I don't know how he does that. You know, if you don't know who that is, look him up, maybe. But uh, maybe don't, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, he's just like, he's, he's psycho. And that's just what he does. And it's, insp it's, it's inspirational. But he, maybe that quote would be something he would love. But for most of us, that is not a natural idea. We're not naturally like, yes, comfort, out of my life, give me pain. That isn't something we're naturally thinking. But if you think about it, 
Nobody gets better at anything by doing nothing. Nobody by sitting on the couch and watching TV ever got better at anything in life except maybe, you know, quoting the show you're watching. But all growth that we desire requires, to some degree, denial of self and denial of our comfort to some degree. All growth that we desire in life, all things we want to achieve are going to require some denial of our self, some denial of our comforts in order to achieve that thing. And I want to, if you could put that verse back up from Luke, I want to kind of think about for a second what Jesus is saying in this verse. When he tells them, he says, you have to deny yourself. So he's saying, what do you have to do to to follow me? To, To deny yourself, to be a disciple. You deny yourself. And then the second step is you pick up your cross and follow me. And we see that, and it's like, that's so beautiful. Like, that's the image. And we, we see that as the, the, the life, the perfect life that Jesus lived for us, where he lived the life that we could never live, and he dies on the cross, and he takes upon, like, all the pain and all the suffering and all the weight of our sin and our mistakes. He takes it to the cross. He's dead, and he rises again three days later. And because of that, if we step into a life with him, and he's the Lord and the Savior of our lives, we can have salvation and we can live life with him. And that's the gospel. And so we see that cross. We see that, we hear this verse, we're like, a cross, that's so beautiful. Think about this though. When Jesus was talking to his disciples in this moment in Luke chapter nine, he had not yet died on the cross. He hadn't done it yet. So that image was not in their mind. But what was in their mind was just the general image. Hundreds of thousands of people were crucified and killed in the same way of Jesus. So what they heard from him was, Anyone that wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and die. That's what they heard. That the entry point to this journey with Jesus was denial and death. And that's what he told them. And we, we see the, the cross ourselves as the door to a relationship with Jesus. We see like, okay, if I accept Jesus and I step into this relationship with him, I can have eternal life. And that is true. But what Jesus is saying is that a life after him, a life of discipleship, means that you come to that cross daily. It's a daily denial of self. It's a daily death every single day. So the point I'm making is that as we go into this series, and what we're talking about, if you're new, is that we're drawing near to Jesus, which is we're trying to do something with our life, in our life, as we pursue Jesus that we might draw more near to him. In order to do that, it's going to require a daily uncomfort. We cannot be comfortable and do this. It's going to require denial of self and death to self every single day. It's impossible. And so as we talk about, again, recentering, we talked about this idea last week of recentering our lives upon Jesus and making him home. That's what it means to abide. It will be impossible without denial of self. We good? Make sense? Intro? Okay, cool. So we opened up last week with week one, of what, today, this is week two, talking about this idea of fasting. And if you weren't here, we invited everybody as a community, as an invitation to fast for 24 hours from, just to make it a little more specific, from the time you eat dinner, the last time you eat dinner on Tuesday evening until 24 hours later on Wednesday. We invited everybody into a fast as a community for that day. And then for the next three weeks or it's two weeks from now, kind of in, a, in alignment with the, what we're doing here as Atmosphere Church, we invited everyone to fast. And if you did that, if you did partake in that fasting, that might have been like the hardest thing. That was the worst thing I've ever done. I'm never doing it again. It's okay that it was hard. And it actually is something that gets better. It gets easier. It actually becomes something that brings you joy. Maybe you did it and it was great. Just remember that when we fast, when we do any of these things, it's, it's a journey. Walking with Jesus is a long road. It's a journey. It's a long road home continually leaning in, continually struggling and having small victories. It's just the way that it goes. But again, with fasting, we talk specifically, and this is just kind of to recap, we, talk about, we talked about what fasting was. And so a simple definition from last week is that fasting is going without food or going without food and water for various periods of time as both rhythm, doing it on a regular basis, as in every Wednesday, and as response, responding to things that happen in our life with fasting. We'll talk more about that this week. And we said that the baseline reason for fasting was we fast out of a hunger for Jesus, that when we're hungry for something, it's because we're lacking that thing. And so because all of us, at some extent, are lacking Jesus, we can respond to that lacking and that hunger 
by fasting. And the last point is that the goal of fasting, the goal of any of these things is always Jesus, not what he can give us. And I saw this amazing quote this week that Jesus is not a bridge. That if you're, if you're pursuing Jesus because you want to have a successful career, if you're pursuing Jesus because you want your relationship, whether your marriage or whatever, to be good, what's going to happen is that if you get that good relationship, if you get that career, even, just, even if you don't, the, that thing ranks above Jesus because you attain that thing by using Jesus as the bridge. He has to be everything. He has, can't be a part of it. He has to be everything for us. The goal of pursuing Jesus is simply Jesus, not the things that he can give us. He is the prize. So this week, we will discuss three of the other primary reasons for fasting found in all of Scripture. They're fun, they're exciting, um, and I hope, that, I hope you'll enjoy them and, and think about them. The first reason is to grow in holiness. The second is to amplify prayer. And the third is to loose the chains of injustice. So first up, to grow in holiness. Now, doctors, uh, it's not hard to find doctors. They don't need to be Christian doctors. Doctors all over, the, all over the, the board have talked about the benefits of fasting, that there are health benefits to your body when you fast. There are all sorts of things from, I'm not going to go into all of them just for sake of time, but uh, it's just it purges your body of certain things. It helps your immune system, this, that, the other. There's a lot of health benefits uh, that, were, that can come from fasting, and these things are great. They have an impact on our body, but they're not the reason that we fast. If you're not fasting out of a motive to lose weight or, or some other thing. But to understand holiness, it does help to talk about our body because remember, we're fasting, uh, fasting to grow in holiness. And the reason is because holiness, maybe you've heard that word thrown around in church and it can be kind of complex and hard to understand. But to help us understand it, what health is for our body, holiness is for our soul. What health is for our body, holiness is for our soul. See, health is operating to the mark of which is good for your life, right? If you are a healthy person, it means you're, meeting, you're, you're getting the right amount of sleep, you're eating the f- right amount of food, you're getting the right amount of, re- or you're, whatever it may be. Health is, is operating at the level of which your body is supposed to operate, uh, the place that your body does best, what you were designed to be at. Holiness is operating and living how God designed us to live. Operating and living to the, to the mark, or towards the mark at least, of which God designed us to be towards, which is a life free of sin, a life without sin in it. So meeting the mark of which Jesus has called us to live, because sin is missing the mark. So holiness is operating and living how God designed us to live. And there's all sorts of sin and brokenness that keep us from living a life of holiness. It could be anger or lust or gossip or addictions from, you know, substances to pornography to whatever it may be. Um, And you may realize at times that when we struggle with these things, and we all do to some degree, it can feel like a war. Like it could feel like there's an actual battle going on in your soul between one thing and another thing when we have this sin in our lives. And listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter seven about this very struggle. This is Paul talking, he says this. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer myself who does it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do, to, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For, my inner being, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? It's almost a tongue twister for a second, but you get the idea. Um, we all relate to this battle on some level. That's the Apostle Paul talking about this battle. 
uh, where we want to do good, we want to pursue Jesus in this way, but we, we feel like we can't. Like we feel like there's this war going on within us. In the Bible, Paul references it here all throughout Romans, talks about this war between our old man or our old nature, which is full of sin, and then our new nature, which we receive when we, when we live a life, when we give our lives to Jesus, this old nature and this new nature. One of the issues in this fight is between these two things is that we often try and fight this battle for holiness with our own willpower. And now willpower, like using just your own willpower to have a better diet or work out more, it, it might work. It probably will work. If you like, you know, just kind of like put your head down and you work hard enough, willpower could carry you through for some of these things. But willpower up against lust, up against addiction, there's not a chance. Willpower on its own cannot carry you through those things and purge those sins from your life. It's not enough. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way to do these things is with, with the Holy Spirit. And Romans 8, 13 says this, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So in other words, fasting is a way to feed your spirit and starve your flesh. So for fasting for holiness, fasting is a way to feed your spirit and starve your flesh. And the reasons for that is that in fasting, we are drawing on the power of God to overcome sin. As opposed to drawing on our own power, we're drawing on the power of God to overcome sin. And, and we do that, there's many different reasons, but I, just to bring it down to one, we do that in doing what's called weaning off of the pleasure principle. So the pleasure principle is this desire that whatever I want, I will then get. And it's all throughout culture. It's like kind of like follow your heart. Just do what your feelings do. It doesn't like whatever you're feeling, that's your truth or whatever it may be. The pleasure principle, like just follow whatever you're desiring is all throughout culture. And so under, under this desire, the food that we want uh, is something that's just gonna make us feel good. And so when we're, if we're hungry because we're fasting, we're then like telling our bodies, like I'm not just gonna respond to whatever I want. I'm not just gonna take and do whatever I wanna do. You're like consciously making a decision to bring God into this battle you're fighting and you're actually becoming better and stronger as you wean yourself off of this idea of whatever I want is what I'm gonna get. And again, we have all sinned and fallen short. We all miss the mark of holiness. We're trying to grow in holiness. We've all missed that mark. So in response to this, remember fasting is done in response to something. We draw on God's power to overcome sin. So that's the first reason. The next reason that we fast is to amplify our prayers. Uh, prayer, which is something we're going to be talking about for the next two weeks, and I'm really excited for that, can be broken down in, if we're going to simplify it, prayer can be broken down into two categories. If you're taking notes, it's listening to God and speaking to God, two major categories for prayer. So prayer can be done without fasting, and fasting can also be done without prayer. Like they both, they can be done without each other. But we see in Scripture, whether we totally understand it or not, when fasting and prayer are brought together every time in Scripture, we see this correlation between between people praying and fasting and God responding all throughout scripture. One can be done without the other, but there's something about it and we don't really understand it, but there's something about those two things being together and God responding to them. So fasting, when it pertains to prayer, fasting helps us to hear God, uh, like I said, hear God and be heard by God. So those two reasons for prayer uh, were to listen to God and, and speak to God. So it helps us to hear God and be heard by God. So first, let's talk about hearing God. And Acts chapter 13 says this. Now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, called Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Menaean, uh, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So notice something. While they were fasting, the Lord spoke to them. While they were in this time of prayer and fasting, in Acts chapter 13, the Lord spoke. And part of, part of this is outside of what we can fully comprehend, but it is clear that when we fast, 
we bring our bodies into obedience. We bring our bodies into the equation of our seeking of Jesus, not just our minds, not just our, our thoughts or whatever it may be, but our bodies are brought, we talked about this last week, our, body, our bodies are brought into the equation of seeking Jesus and we can hear the Lord more clearly. And I know this is something that uh, has been true for my life. It's true uh, for people's lives, many people that I know, that there's something about fasting that just opens up our ears to hear God more clearly. It does something with distraction or whatever it may be. And uh, Josiah, I, I asked him if I could share this story, but years ago, uh, we were kind of fasting as a community. A few of us were fasting uh, once a week. And he had this moment where he was, he was fasting uh, and it was an afternoon and he was sitting in his car uh, just worshiping the Lord. And he had a vision, uh, and if you could ask him to describe it to you, but it was like, something you would see out of the Old Testament, like in the throne room of God, like just weeping before the Lord. One of the craziest, probably the craziest vision I've ever personally known that someone has had. In this time that he was fasting, something about it allowed him to hear from the Lord more clearly. In Joel 2, verse 12, it says this, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And in Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13, it says this, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And that second one from Jeremiah doesn't specifically say fasting, but it's that same phrase, seek me with all of your heart, that fasting has something to do with putting everything on the table in our seeking of God. Like it's, there is nothing, our bodies are on the line here. Like we are fully and completely seeking God. And some advice I heard in a teaching on fasting years ago uh, from a pastor, and he just said this. He said, man, I, you, I don't know what your understanding is of fasting. He said, but because of these things, because of how well you can hear God, he said, I beg you, before you make any major decision, before, whether it's to get married or to, whatever, or to start dating someone or a, a career move, whatever it may be, he said, I beg you, just fast. Take some time and set apart for fasting because you will hear God more clearly. And I remember that. I don't remember many details else what he said, but I've held on to that advice because there's something about hearing God that is amplified when we fast. And this is what the New Testament will go on and call discernment. You've heard about this, kind of discerning God's voice. There's so much noise in our lives and it does, it does us really good when we do something to eliminate that noise and hear God more clearly. And the truth is as well, that many of you may know, I know truly, I know it's true for my life, that there are times that I have been seeking God for something and he did not seemingly show up. And it could have been something I'm like, God, please, you know, it's, it's a healing or it's to move in some mighty way. And he, sometimes he shows up in some crazy powerful way and sometimes he doesn't. And we, we won't understand that on this side of eternity. And there's conversations to be had about what is at play and how do we best come to grips with that. But we know something that it's not about a guarantee that I will hear from God if I fast, but you wanna put yourself in the best position to hear from God. If you're seeking him and needing to hear from him with discernment on a career, on a relationship, on a life choice, wouldn't you wanna be in the best position to hear from God? And God is always speaking, but there's something special about when we fast and his response. And the next thing is that fasting helps us to be heard by God. Now again, God always, he, just as he's always listening, God always hears us. He always hears us regardless of if we're fasting or not. But with many of these points, if you open up scripture, there's something special about people fasting and God responding. And people fasting and, and God seeming to hear their prayers. And it's not something you could fully understand. And again, this isn't a hunger strike for God. You're not like, God, I will not eat until you hear my prayers. It's not, it's not gonna work. That's not, that's not what this is about. It's not some, like, you're not dueling with the Lord on like him hearing you or him hearing your prayers or whatever it may be. That's not what it is. It's not a hunger strike for God. But just go back, Jeremiah 29 and that just verse 13. When you seek me, you will find me when? when you seek me with all of your heart. There's just something that the Lord honors about our entire, everything we have being on the table before him, like putting all of our eggs in the basket of just seeking him. And there's not a clear answer to why this is the case. Um, there's many people that have different opinions. Why does God answer in, in, in life and in scripture? Why does God answer when we pray and fast? People have all sorts of reasons why God honors the hearts of those who seek him. Because sometimes he 
moves in someone's life that's not seeking him or he does, vice versa. There's, there's not a clear answer, but my best understanding and what I believe is that it's because God is relational and he desires closeness and intimacy with his creation. And so prayer and fasting by nature are gonna be kind of burning away the things that separate us from God. Like you're literally removing distractions when you do those things. And God's desire is closeness with you. And so there's something that God responds to when we make intentional steps to remove the the, the weeds between us and him and to draw near to him. There's something that God responds to in that. And again, there's all sorts of theories and thoughts on why God does or does not answer prayer. And it's a deep topic and conversation that we'd love to continue to have. But one thing is clear is that God responds to prayer and fasting. Look at Jonah chapter three. Uh, this is verses five through 10, just five and um, kind of skipping down to 10. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So Jonah was a prophet and he was sent. If you've never heard the story, if you ever heard of the whale story, maybe like that's this one. So go read it. It's only a few chapters. Jonah is sent to these people called the Ninevites and, he, and they've, been, they've been walking away from God. And he basically tells them, hey, God's gonna destroy you. Sorry, you know, sucks to suck. And then like, that's just what he does. And that's kind of, it is kind of his, his posture in the conversation with him. It's, it's a whole thing. Go read it. And they respond in this way. It says they, were, they believed God. They believed that was true. They believed that was gonna happen and they proclaimed a fast. And so something interesting I wanted to point out. You see that it says that the people turned from their evil ways and that God relented. And the word there, it should be on the screen, if you could put that up on the screen, Naham and Naham are the same word, the same Hebrew word for turned from their evil ways and relented. It's the same word, and we kind of lose it in our translation into English. But it says, basically, when they Nahamed, God Nahamed. When they nahamed, God nahamed. And so it's super interesting. And so that word naham can be translated uh, as the definition would be repent, relent, or to change one's mind. And so this passage, because this isn't the only time this exact wording is seen in scripture, specifically in the Old Testament, where people repent and then God, using the same word, makes the same decision of you could say that God repented and we kind of wrestle with that. We're like, how, how could, God's not wrong. How could he be? But it, it has many definitions of repent, relent, or to change one's mind. Again, when they nahamed, God nahamed. He responded to their repentance. He responded to their heart. Here's an interesting quote from Arthur Wallace in a book called God's Chosen Fast, which I haven't read the whole book, but reading part of it uh, in prepare, preparing for this teaching, I do recommend it, but um, says this. Because man repents, changes his mind in respect to sin, God repents or changes his mind in respect to judgment. Man's change of heart makes it morally possible for God to behave differently towards him, yet still acting consistently with his holy character and principles. It's a super interesting quote. Um, And so how does this happen? How can God... You could be uncomfortable hearing this, and that's totally okay. How can God be fully sovereign, fully in control, fully all-knowing, which are just truths that we see about God in Scripture. Those are realities of life. How can he be those things and yet also be moved by and answer the prayers of his people? How can those two things coexist? And I, I don't know. And I don't think that you're gonna find someone that can tell you with certainty why those two things exist. And it's, it's okay to find ourselves in the middle ground. We just have to look, what does the Bible say? And the Bible has both those things being true. So both, the, both those things should be true for our lives. Why do we sometimes seek God and he moves and he heals, but then other times he's seemingly silent? We don't know. But the need, the need for us to seek God for, in prayer Seek God for a situation to change. Seek God for healing. Seek God for any of these different things while also falling into the peace of his sovereignty are both equally essential. Those two things can coexist of me being like, yeah, I'm gonna pray to the Lord and believe for something to change and also know that he is ultimately in control. And so the final reason that we fast 
is to loose the chains of injustice. And that is not a catchy title that I thought of. I'm not creative. Um, We'll go right to the scripture. Isaiah 58, verses six through nine. Is not this the kind of fast I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn. Your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. Most of you know, some of you don't know, Um, that Christians were the first ones to set up things like hospitals, things like kind of like social justice type systems that we see now as far as shelters for homeless people and food, like Christians were the first ones to do these things way back in the early centuries. Christians were the first ones. Uh, And you might have not known this, but the Black Plague, which in Europe, which most of you probably learned about in history class, uh, you may have fallen asleep for it. So I'll just remind you, there's the Black Plague that happened um, in Europe as people were fleeing all of the big cities to get away from this plague that was killing people, the ones that stayed, and this is one of the things that's responsible for the explosion of the church, were Christians. Christians stayed specifically at monasteries in different places and took in the sick and took care of them. And there's a correlation between that and an explosion in the, in the size of the church. And it says in Acts chapter two, that among all the early followers of Jesus, none of them had any need. None of them were in need. Like they all had their needs taken care of. And most of us know that if you're a Christian, uh, you're probably supposed to be generous with your money and your time. Like, yeah, I just, that's just kind of something that that goes along with it or is supposed to go along with it. Um, And if you're like me, though, even though all those things are true, money and time are like, I don't have a lot of either of those things. Like, at all. I don't, I don't have any money. So uh, you could be the same. We're all kind of in the same season of life here. Like money and time are, are hard to come by and some months and some years much more than other. And so to be generous with our money and to be generous with our time is way easier said than done. And I often come across things like watching the church take care of each other and I'm like convicted by that. I'm like, man, who am I, am I taking care of anyone? I can hardly take care of myself. Like, I, I mean, how are people doing this? And especially, I, I think about with, even if there was, if the end of the month you have leftover money or you had leftover time, theoretically, just with the pace of life and the way that we're just going day to day, just thing to thing, work to home, to school, to practice, whatever you have going on, with the pace of life, even when there is leftover money and leftover time, uh, it's already spent and gone before you actually realize it was there that that extra money you have, like that could have gone somewhere, it's gonna be spent because life is just fast. And if you had extra time, it kind of sneaks up on you and you're like, man, I could have used this time to go do something, but it happened too quick. I missed that window. And fasting in scripture and throughout church history was done as response to the poverty and injustice in the world in order to create a rhythm to actually do something about it. Because even then, they recognize money and time are tough to come by. And so we have to do something with our life to where we can actually work in a rhythm of being generous with those things, or it's never going to actually happen. And fasting was that thing. And one of the designs of fasting was to take the extra time, the extra money, the extra food, or whatever you have, uh, whatever you would have eaten, whatever, the time you would have used to prepare it, whatever it was, and to give it to someone else. That's a practice of the church for many years. We see it here in scripture. Uh, Some church traditions, uh, even up till today, they fast on Wednesdays and Fridays, and Fridays specifically, they use that day as a day of service. They volunteer with a nonprofit. They volunteer in their church. They do something. They use that time of fasting specifically to give up their time. And the shepherd of Hamas, he says this, estimate, this was, well, this was a Christian writing, excuse me. It's a Christian writing uh, from a couple years after uh, Revelation was written, it was considered to be a part of the Bible at one point. So just, just for time, for, just for reference. Estimate the cost of food you would have eaten on that day and give that amount to a widow or, or orphan or someone in need. Be humble in this way. And the one who receives something because of your humility may fill his soul 
and pray to the Lord for you. Uh, St. George of Nicaea, he says this, give to the hungry what you deny your own appetite, speaking of fasting. And uh, man, you guys can start coming out. Um, This could seem like really funny, but it's a, a really simple way to allot money, time, and resources on a small, small scale, like one person at a time, to making a difference, to giving back, to giving those things away. And to, in the, the words of scripture, loosing the chains of injustice in our communities. And that could be for you, like literally the time that you spend making your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're like, I'm gonna allot that amount of time to serve a person. And I'm gonna go serve one of my parents. I'm gonna go serve one of my grandparents. I'm gonna serve someone in the church. I'm gonna volunteer at a local place. Uh, the, the money that you would have spent on lunch, maybe you eat out every single day uh, for lunch at work. And you're like, I usually spend you know, $15, which in Westlake, it's probably more like $200. So you're like, I usually spend, it's just terrible, right? I usually spend this amount of money. And so I'm gonna Venmo this to a friend I know, like, couldn't make rent this week or something along those lines. Or maybe you're like, well, I usually make breakfast every morning. I'm just gonna make it this morning and I'm gonna drive and I'm gonna, on my way, I know, there's a homeless guy, I see him every time I'm gonna give him my breakfast. Simple, it's small. But this is the way that the early church made their impact. It was, they, weren't, they weren't rich people often and there were some of them that were, but many of them were not. And so it was simple things like fasting and then being intentional with that time that they were able to use. So in closing, uh, I say this every week, I said it at the beginning, fasting is of no value to your relationship with Jesus unless it is done in response to being saved by him. Do you have to come to a realization that you are a sinner, that that we are all broken and that we are in need of a savior? And it is from that place, man, Jesus is my Lord and my savior. You recognize that grace, that then from there you can move the overflow of that is fasting, but it's not something that is done before. So if you're like, man, I've never given my life over to Jesus, said this same thing last week, just stop now, don't worry about this whole fasting thing and come talk to someone on our prayer team afterwards about that. But the final thing, the invitation for us this week is to again fast on Wednesdays for a 24-hour period. It's simply invitational, it's on the table, it's for you to take, you don't have to do it, it's a suggestion. Fast on Wednesday for 24 hours, Uh, but do so in an intentional response to one of the things we talked about. So last week was kind of like maybe just getting the feel for it or this week, maybe that's this week for you. You're just kind of trying to figure this whole thing out. And the next week is having some intentionality about it. Maybe it's to grow in holiness. It's to amplify prayer. There's a specific prayer on your heart. You're like, man, I'm gonna take this day specifically and pray through those things. Or maybe in the words of Isaiah 58, it's to loose the chains of injustice. And be intentional with money or time or resources on that day to give it to somebody. I'm going to pray, um, and then we're going to worship. And then from there, uh, we'll go into, into discussion groups, and we'll have some more time to kind of talk these things out. I'm sure there's some questions as well. Uh, this is something that's exciting, though. And there's just a f- more fullness of the presence of the Lord that's available to us, more fullness of your realization of his goodness that's available to us in prayer and in fasting. And again, it's not ever commanded by Jesus or any of the New Testament writers, not commanded to fast. It's simply invitational. It's something that's on the table. So I'm gonna pray and then we'll go from there. Lord, we uh, just stand in awe of you and we're thankful for the fact that you desire to meet with us. We're thankful for the fact that you honor the hearts of those who seek you. Would you help us to come to peace with the times that we seek you and it seems that we can't find you? And would you meet those that are seeking you with all of their heart tonight about something that they've maybe never told anyone about, but it's just weighing them down and they're chasing after you. Would you meet them with your love, Lord, and would they they find you in their seeking? Meet us in this time of worship, Lord. Help us to see you more clearly. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can go ahead and stand in response.
conversation in our groups, Lord. Would you just lead us to truth um, through your spirit, Lord. We don't want to assign our own truth to things. We don't want to um, know anything apart from you, Lord. So would you just um, give us the wisdom and understanding to um, speak about you, Lord, to get closer to you. I pray that this community would just um, go and be closer to you, Lord. That's the whole point, to be close to you, to be close to you. Would be the case in this room and throughout our week, Lord, when we are away from one another. We love you so much, Lord. It's your name that we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Sorry, I just cut you off. Were you not done? Okay. That would be awkward. Uh, Anyway. Uh, we're going to go into groups. Tanner said it. We're going to go into groups. Uh, so that's what we do if it's your first time here. For the next 30-ish minutes, there'll be some questions for you to discuss uh, on the screen. So if you've been here a million times, Grab someone or some people that, that are new so that they feel welcome. Get into groups of like four or five or so. There's a few tables in the back, uh, but other than that, you can move the chairs or do whatever you want to do, sit where you're at, and then we'll come back together in a little bit. All right, hit it. 